Okay, so we'll get started. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, before I start, I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land where I am tonight, which is the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, as I said earlier uh, in the waiting room, we've had an amazing response to this webinar. Uh, it's only the second one in our series on end of life issues. Uh, the last webinar that we held in March was on the importance of advanced care planning. And for that, we had nearly 350 participants live and then nearly a thousand people have so far watched the recording. Um, this webinar titled Empowering the Elderly, How to Avoid the End of Life Conveyor Belt had even more registration than the last time. Today, when I checked, we had uh, 13, th sorry, 1,352 people who had RSVP'd. And uh, I can see now that we have 432 with people still coming in the waiting room. So that's fantastic. Uh, some of the people that registered um, won't be able to take part in the live event, but they're very keen uh, to catch up and watch it later. So as I mentioned, a link to the recording will be emailed to everyone who registered, uh, hopefully in the next week or so. I'll just, I'll start by uh, sharing my screen just for the introduction, bear with me. Hope everyone can see that. So um, although many of you are very interested in this uh, topic and you may be accustomed to talking about end of life care or death, <clears throat> it's still possible that some of you uh, might find parts of the presentation upsetting. And so if anything that we talk about this evening raises distressing issues for you uh, and you need to talk to someone, please uh, contact one of the support lines, either Lifeline on 13 11 14 or Beyond Blue 1300 double two four six three six or any other counselling service that you may have access to. Just got um, some notes. So as I said, this one uh, follows, this webinar follows on uh, the advanced care planning one. Uh, that, that one was more focused on end of life documents. So writing your advanced care directive or appointing an enduring guardian. This time we're going to focus on how to avoid uh, the end of life conveyor belt that can sometimes result in uh, deaths that are far from an ideal. Um, as many of you know, many elderly people linger in pain and confusion in ICU when all they want to do is die at home in peace. Um, and for some, ICU has become a place where the frail or soon to die are given unnecessary op operations and treatments uh, prolonging their lives without their wishes being taken into account. Um, we and our loved ones need to be better equipped and emboldened to ask the, uh, the options uh, in hospital that should be offered to us, uh, but mostly aren't. Um, there are other gentler options for patients um, and uh, that can be much more sympathetic to the final wishes of people facing the end of their lives. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So we're fortunate to have two very experienced uh, guest speakers for this topic, Professor Ken Hillman AO and Associate Professor Gideon Kaplan. Both doctors have extensive history, uh, so extensive experience, I should say, in end of life care. So I'm confident that we're gonna leave tonight uh, with a much better understanding of this topic. And I will introduce both speakers before handing over to uh, Professor Hillman to start our conversation. Um, so uh, Ken Hillman uh, is Professor of Intensive Care at the University of New South Wales. Ken graduated from Sydney University and trained at St Vincent's Hospital in Sydney and, and St Bartholomew's Hospital in London. He was one of the first formally trained intensive care specialists and became the director of intensive care at Charing Cross Hospital in London before returning to Australia to become the director at uh, Liverpool Hospital in Sydney. He has over 210 peer reviewed publications, approximately 90 chapters in textbooks. He's co-authored an intensive care textbook, co-edited several textbooks, 
written two books aimed at the general public and has acquired over $23 million in peer reviewed grants. He has been invited to address over 130 international conferences and over 140 national conferences. Ken has held many professional positions related to health and is the director of the Simpson Centre for Health Services Research. He has an Order of Australia and has a high profile in the area of end of life and has given a, a TEDx talk at the Sydney Opera House on the subject. Associate Professor Gideon Kaplan uh, is Director of Post-Acute Care Services and Director of Geriatric Medicine at Prince of Wales Hospital and a Conjoint Associate Professor at the University of New South Wales in Sydney. He is editor of the most recent textbook of geriatric medicine in Australia and has researched and written about advanced care planning, as well as providing end-of-life care for many people. He has served as a consultant to the Commonwealth and state, state health departments, including the Australian Health Minister's Advisory Council. So I'll end uh, the share screen now. There we go. Uh, and I'll hand over to Professor K uh, Ken Hillman uh, so that he can provide his introduction on this topic, Empowering the Elderly, How to Avoid the End-of-Life Conveyor Belt. So over to you, Ken, if you want to unmute yourself. Um, um, thank, you, thank you very much for that introduction. I can stop panicking. Yeah, so I've, I've worked for about 40, year, 40 years in intensive care and over that time, it's changed enormously. When I first started, there were mainly younger people with a single problem, like severe trauma, severe infection, and things like that. And then we developed amazingly effective ways of keeping people alive. Drugs, machines, all sorts of things. And so it has become very, very difficult to die in a hospital and to die in intensive care. We can do incredible things these days to keep people alive. However, over that 40 years, we sort of, you know, we sort of have been tempted to use these machines in ways that they weren't actually planned for. And so that, that's what we're talking about tonight. And, and it's very tempting for doctors to just add one more drug or to add one more machine and, and keep people alive. It's very difficult for doctors to let people die. I should say that from the from, from um, right from the beginning. So the current fallback position, if you're elderly frail, and I want to just talk about the elderly frail, not about people with terminal cancer, because that's another that's another topic altogether. But the current fallback position, if you're elderly frail in the community, is to be hospitalised, and. That's very interesting how that's come about. So you get very sick at home or you're in or you're in an aged care place. And the, the first instinct is, you know, is that it's very frightening when someone falls or when someone becomes seriously ill. So the temptation and the and the first thing that we do is to ring the ambulance. So the ambulance comes, the ambulance hasn't got any sort of discretionary power or very little discretionary power. So they take you into the emergency department. The emergency department are programmed to deal with the immediate sort of emergency under their nose. And they're very, they're very busy, they're very overwhelmed. So they haven't got time or they or they're not geared up to having these complex lengthy discussions with you. And so they put drips in you, they give you drugs and they keep you alive. Then they have to make the decision whether you go home or come into hospital. And if you're seriously ill, they bring you into hospital. And once in the hospital, you may sort of deteriorate even more. And so it's often I get calls from my colleagues saying, Ken, I've got a 90 year old person here, um, but they're a very good 90 year old. They're always a very good 90 year old. And I've had a chat to the relatives and they want everything done. Now you you can you can you can see the well-meaning doctor here in that in that they're talking to the relatives, but they often put this question in the wrong way. They say, for example, look, your mother, your father is extremely ill, and there's a high chance that they may may die. 
but we could increase their treatment. We could transfer them um, up to the intensive care unit. What do you think? Now, if you put the question like that, that really puts a lot, a lot of a lot of emphasis on the sons and the daughters and the relatives to make this decision. So you'd have to be a very brave person to say, no, we should just let them die. Now I know, I, you know, like I know amongst the audience here, many of you would would have the courage to say no, they wouldn't have liked this. Therefore, I wouldn't I wouldn't I wouldn't want them to have increased treatment. But unfortunately, that's not the case with many other people in our society. They're sort of confronted by this emergency and and um, and and they feel like that you know, their life is in their hands. And by saying, no, you should let them die is, you know, is really putting too much responsibility on them. So in summary, it's very difficult to pluck these people off this convey belt. That's just the way it is. We now have data that, that sort of enables us to predict when elderly frail people are nearing the end of life. It's very good data. It's it's, you know, like it's as good as the data with people with terminal cancer, for example. And, and so we, we, sort of, we sort of have good evidence to say that this person has probably less than 12 months to live. So that really means that they're terminally ill. But we don't talk about the elderly frail being terminally ill. If you have cancer, we can sort of predict now there's inherent uncertainty with that, but we can, you know, we've got a good ways of predicting when someone with terminal cancer is nearing the end, when all of the treatments have been exhausted. But we don't use the term terminally ill with the elderly frail. So that's part of the reason why they're on the conveyor belt. Even, even more concerning is that the health system doesn't use the word terminally ill with the elderly frail and and that's a problem so you've got a society or people that don't know that they're in the last year of life and you've got a health system that doesn't treat these people as if they're in the last year of life so so that's a huge problem and it's it's sort of related to bigger issues such as society doesn't like talking about dying and death and Many of our doctors, bless their hearts, are programmed to cure you, to make you better. It's, it's still not a big part of our training where we learned, where, uh, where we learned to talk about death and dying in, in, you know, in much more honest and transparent ways. So we, we've sort of tried to overcome this in many ways. And I'll just briefly describe some of the ways because they have mainly failed. So, for example, we did a large sort of study with five countries, 13 hospitals, trying to intercept the elderly frail when they come into the emergency department. And it didn't work. It was a failure. And, and, that's, and, that, and that's related to the fact that these people are seriously ill and we're concentrating on saving their lives for that, you know, for that particular time. Then we've, then we've recently done a large study in Brisbane where in, in uh, three hospitals where we could pre predict with the, with the uncertainty that you know, the elderly fail is coming near the end of the life, that is within 12 months or so. And then we'd inform the admitting team about that and, and see what happens. So there was a large control group where we didn't tell the admitting team about about prognosis and the other group where we did. Interestingly enough, the control group did better. So trying to tell the admitting team about what's happening didn't appear to work. So then we've been working with general practice and I've just had a chat to Heath, who's also on the panel here, and, and it didn't work either. And that wasn't because the GPs weren't interest, in, interested it was mainly related to the fact that they're not sort of reimbursed to have these long conversations. So where do we go from here? Well, the more, the more work we've done in this area, the more it becomes clear to me that we need to empower people. And 
simply having advanced care planning, advanced care directive doesn't seem to work effectively for many cases. And so that leads me to the concept which I'm sure many of you have heard about is shared decision making. So at the moment, although doctors are much better at talking to people about what they what they do and try, trying to include them with risks, et cetera, um, it seems to be an, a fairly unequal relationship where the doctor says, this is what you should do, can you sign here? Shared decision making is a is a is a is a way of including people, what their attitudes, beliefs are, and translating that into genuine goals of care and health planning. So I think really that the most important thing is to is to empower people to have control about their own goals of care. So if we have data that sort of defines when people are, say, for example, in the last 12 months of life, and we combine that with shared decision-making. So in the light of that prognosis, people can make genuine choices about their own goals of care. So the next step is to communicate that with the health system. And that's a problem at the moment. It's not, it's not sort of communicated very well with the health system. But, that can be overcome, especially with, with you know, with e-health and technology and, uh, and other ways of communicating with the health system. So what, what I'd like to put to you is, is, is that the most important document in health should be the results of the shared decision making. If you're a doctor now, the first thing you do is to take a history of the patient, find out what sort of health they've had in the past, what their family history have been like, have a look at you, do tests and investigations. Who you are is way down the list. And so I, th so I think that the answer is that we need to empower people to, to state what, who they are and what they would like, and then to make sure that this is the most powerful document that we have in health. Shane, I think I might stop there because I'm sure I'm sure there's a lot of questions around this issue, um, and and I'm sure that you know I'm sure that the questions will um, you, you know will help to elaborate on the, on these sort of issues. Sure. No. Well, that was a really fabulous introduction, Ken. So I think before we take questions, well, I'd like to firstly say, um, well, thank you for the introduction, but also encourage all our participants, and we're up to uh, 541, please use the chat uh, in the side to, uh, if you've already thought of some questions, uh, just put them as briefly as possible, or even they can be longer if you've got time, you don't want to get distracted, but if you can put them in the chat when once uh, Gideon has given his talk, uh, we can start working our way through those questions. So I'll now um, hand over to Gideon, Professor Associate Professor Gideon Kaplan, uh, to give us his introduction on this topic. Thanks. Thank you, Shane, and thank you, Ken, for those wise words and your experience and your views are really ring very true to me as well. We, we do have a problem in society talking about death, unfortunately. It, it's one of those taboo subjects that people are often uncomfortable talking about. And so whereas a lot of people have thought about and have formed views about their own death and what they would like it to be. And surveys universally show that people would prefer to die at home. What is the normal course of events is completely different to that. And we know that 55% of people die in hospital and often surrounded by those machines that go beep and um, really cut off from being able to embrace their loved ones. And it's a very lonely and an artificial situation. And uh, it's not comfortable at all. And people are a victim of a number of forces or, or changes, things that happen, have happened in society that, that make it harder to have that peaceful, quiet death at home surrounded by your loved ones that you see in movies or TV shows very often 
um, which look so appealing. First of all, people are living longer. It's one of the great triumphs of Western medicine and also public health that people do stay alive longer. But most people still have a period at the end of their, of their life of disability. And they often have multiple hospitalizations during that episode of disability. And we often see people tell us that on a previous admission, one of the doctors said, you know, the children tell us that one of the doctors said on the previous mission, they said they could die or they were going to die. And look, they recovered and they've lasted another six months. Um, therefore, we don't believe it anymore when a doctor tells us they're going to die. Um, so there, there's that scepticism. And many people are also skeptical that doctors just want to kill everybody which, as Ken said, doctors really are trained to try and do too much to get people better when even when it's futile. And, and that's what doctors are doing. They're giving treatments that don't help to people at the end of their life um, and putting them through long periods of painful, difficult treatments that they don't help them, that are futile. Um, so it's, it's not at all that the doctors are trying to kill them. Um, and if that were the case, they would be found out very quickly. Um, we also know that, unfortunately, people don't or rarely do communicate to their families, to their decision makers, their substitute decision makers, what their wishes are about when they're sick, when they are admitted to hospital, when they're dying. And nowadays, the statistics show that the number one cause of death for women in Australia is dementia. And the number two cause of death for men in Australia is dementia. So that means that for those big groups of people with dementia, they are unable to express their preferences and their wishes about treatment and about how they want to die when they come into hospital because their cognitive function doesn't allow them to communicate that. So unless they've spoken before they got dementia to their families and written it down in an advanced care directive, then no one really knows what their opinion is and it can't be taken into account. So that kind of either an advanced care directive or shared decision-making is extremely important if people want to have their voice heard when they approach the end of their life. And Research that we have done shows that in certain situations, advanced care planning can be very effective. So we did a study looking at people in nursing homes. And we showed that getting families to do advanced care planning when someone was admitted to a nursing home and deciding what treatment they wanted going forward, whether they wanted to be admitted to hospital if they got sick, whether they wanted to be on a drip or be in ICU, and almost everyone did not want those treatments when they thought about it, you know, in a peaceful time when the person wasn't sick, they realized that that was what people did not want. But the problem is when people get sick, and as I say, the meter goes to the red zone, no one can think clearly. People are just guided by the suggestions of the doctor. So when the doctor says, as Ken mentioned, well, we could transfer your mum to intensive care. We could transfer your mum to hospital. We could put your mum on a drip, on a ventilator, on a BiPAP, on uh, all the different technologies they've got, which, which are becoming more and more amazing, but really don't help people when they're frail and sick at all. Um, people can't think clearly and they say, yes, I don't know what to do. Let's just do it and we'll think about it down the track. And, and people get into this vortex of increasing treatment, which sucks them in further and further. So it's really important to discuss these things ahead of time. And we found in our study that having those discussions when people went into a nursing home, reduced the number of transfers to hospital and actually kept people alive longer, reduced the mortality rate by 10% because those treatments in hospital don't help people. They make things worse and people don't realize it. And that's the, the, that's the paradox of over healthcare 
that it's killing people. We have to adjust the amount of healthcare people have for their healthcare situation, for their needs. Doing everything is often worse than doing light touch care. And doctors need to understand and people need to understand that what's best for you is different at different stages of your life. So I'm happy to pause there and answer questions. Um, Okay, well, that that was that was another really um, interesting introduction. And so, Matt, as you, as you've both said, I think uh, looking at the questions that have come in, and there's been a lot. I've been copying and pasting them madly as you were speaking, Gideon. So, thank you for the, for your presentation. And um, I'll now look at the questions and and ask them uh, to, to both of you if that's okay. I actually had there were a few questions that um, came in before uh, the webinar, so I might ask at least a couple of those, and then we might just sort of go between the two. Um, the the this, these first few questions are were from one of our directors, Liz Jacker, who has recently reread Ken's book uh, titled "A Good Life to the End" that was published in uh, 2017. So Liz um, has asked, how was your book received by the medical profession, Ken? Yeah, look, I'm I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure how, you know, like, like how to answer that because, you know, like I've got friends who are doctors and of course they would say, yes, wonderful book. Um, but, but I did get a few emails from, you know, from sort of colleagues who I didn't know. They said, yes, that, you, you know, that they can relate to the book. So look, look, it's a hard, it's a hard question to answer, but look, you know, like I'm sure, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure that Gideon would agree. It's very difficult to change the attitudes of our colleagues, um, you know, like, like they programmed over many years to make you better. So it's very, it's very difficult to change their whole attitude around. I think. Um, so the you know the uh, you, you know the more I think about this issue, and I know you know like I know that I've drifted off the question here, Shane. I'm sorry about that, <laughs> but but it but it's sort of you know that we need to work around the doctors. I think um, I I don't you, you know I don't think that that's the entire answer. I think you know I think that by you know that by empowering the community is more the answer. So so. For example, in the 1960s, when, uh, uh, when you know, like uh, when, when I was a medical student, every woman having a baby was admitted to a hospital. You were strung up in, you know, with your legs apart, you had the baby, baby taken away from you, father not allowed to be there. And then things changed. But I don't think it was the doctors that changed. I think it was society that demanded a different way of delivering babies. And if that can happen at the beginning of life, I, I think it could happen at the end. But I really think it's up to the community to start to demand this. Right. Mm. And before I move to the next question uh, in the chat, someone suggested I, I can hear everyone or the speakers quite clearly, um, but maybe some people are having difficulties and someone has suggested uh, that if we all, well, not everybody, I think that the um, the hosts need to keep their videos on. But if you, if some of you are happy to, you know, stop your video so that we don't see you, um, we can see if that improves things for for those that are having trouble with reception. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody else with a lot of experience uh, has an opinion on that, but we could give it a go, um, and maybe the person who suggests it can see in the chat. So the, another question, again, uh, to do with your the book. Um, do you think that things have changed since your book was published in 2017? And as I mentioned, um, I have a book that Ken wrote in 2009, so that was even longer ago. But do, do you feel that there has been some change or not really? Um, look, I think there's been some change um, in, in, our, in our society. But... <laughs> But if I'm to be honest, I, you know, I haven't seen too much change in the, you know, in the way that we deal with patients. I still, you know, when I do a ward round of an evening or morning, it's very, very rare when one of us doesn't say, please don't ever let this happen to me. Hmm. 
So why are we saying that and why aren't we doing anything about it? It's very difficult because it's a very complex chain of events that led to the person coming into the intensive care unit. So, you know, so I guess my colleagues think that their role is limited. Um, yeah. So I don't think things have changed too much in the health system, but I think that things have changed in our community. Um, I would like to ask, um, because based on phone calls that we get to dine with dignity, and there's been a, a few recently where a, an adult um, has rung from either hospital or just outside hospital, and they have a parent uh, in, inside a hospital, obviously at, at an end of life, uh, situation and they really as you said doctors aren't good about um, sort of talk being talking about it openly so they've sort of asked you know what can they do what can they say do you do, and this is a question that would be really good to hear from both of you um, you know how does a, a um, if a family member let, let's say a daughter because it was actually two daughters that rang most recently um, how does a daughter open up that conversation with the medical team who you know who should they speak to and in what sort of language do they use I obviously gave advice just based on what I've learned over the last 10 years uh, working with dying with dignity but I'm not a health professional and uh, you know very limited experience but uh, apparently what I said really did help but what would you both of you advise? to if, if a family member, a spouse or a, a, a son or daughter or whatever, another love, loved one, um, you know, how do you get a better, clearer idea about what the options are and what the, the prognosis might be? Get in. Look, it's very useful if families tell us or if the patient themselves can tell us that their preference for treatment is X or Y or Z. Uh, and the great difficulty is, as someone posted in the chat, what happens when different members of the family have completely opposite viewpoints? And that's where we can end up being going around in circles for quite a while until we can get everyone onto the same page with sharing the same viewpoint. And as I said, a lot of geriatric patients by the time they come in, they cannot express their opinion about what kind of treatment they want. So we utterly rely on the family telling us what their preferences are. And a lot of people do not give a clear and coherent um, limitations to treatment uh, story to us or, or relate that this was the person's preference. And often because they don't actually know, they've never talked about it with their parents. Mm. So it's very important to tell that to the doctor upfront in emergency and then also the doctors on the ward and to keep saying that this is mum's preference and or well, this is all of our preferences for mum, um, that, that we want this. And so they understand. And no one will accuse them of trying to kill their mum or mm. trying to do away with her. You know, you know, it's people accept it. We've had situations, for example, and this is an unusual case where we had a couple come into the emergency department and they were married, they were devoted to each other. Uh, they'd been looking after each other at home for a long time. And the wife had dementia and the husband didn't, but he was physically unwell and he could no longer look mm -hmm. after his wife. And they had made a pact that they would mutually commit suicide if it got to the stage that they couldn't stay at home. And they took a type of poison and they both were brought into the emergency department. And unfortunately, the husband had died from his dose and the wife who had dementia had not died, but was dying. But we could have given her an antidote to stop her dying in this situation. But when we found out the back the story, the, the history of this couple, we felt that it was actually better that their wishes should be abided by. And so the wife was not given the antidote and was allowed to slip away. Now other 
if she'd been given the antidote, would have ended up in a nursing home with dementia, which was exactly where she didn't want to be. And we strongly felt that the most humane thing was to abide by her wishes. Mm -hmm. So that gives an idea of, you know, that doctors will follow people's wishes if they're clearly communicated and expressed. Shane, well, well, I think I think it I think it comes back, uh, you know, like it comes back, back to Gideon's point that the earlier you do things like this, the better. It, it's very very difficult once I get into emergency departments and sort of hospitals. It's very difficult for the lay public to find their way around that system. You know, so there's a hierarchy of doctors and the doctors are changing with shifts. And then you've got nurses who usually aren't included so much in the conversations, which is not a good thing. So, so you know, Gideon's story is, you know, is one that tells us that, you know, that you really need someone like Gideon if you encounter that particular situation. However, many doctors, are, you know, are focused on the next step, which is the anecdote and keeping the person alive so the answer to your question how do, you know how does one navigate that I, I, it, it is very difficult because the whole hospital system is very complex and it's very difficult for you to know how to relate to it and you know like I get two or three calls a week uh, you know from friends or colleagues or friends of friends asking me what do I do now and how can I intervene well I know how to do it and I can talk to the people who need to be talked to but most of our society can't so I guess it comes back to something like a case manager doesn't it uh, once you're in hospital but even more importantly it goes back to Gideon's point that the earlier you have these discussions the better I, I, I'll go to thank you for those answers I'll um, run through some of the questions just in the order that they came in the chat so one of the first questions um, uh, was, is it best just to not call the ambulance? Yeah, yes, it probably is. But again, it needs to be, it needs to be by the person involved. So if, if that person has made clear sort of decisions that, you know, that they don't want the ambulance call, well, then it needs to be written down somewhere so that it's not one of these sort of decisions that the poor, the, you know, that the poor relatives have, have to make on the spot. And, and if, if, if I can come back to that situation, there are, there are, you know, like, like there's a movement to treat people in their home. But, you know, that there are some people who, who when they're nearing the end of life, and when they, um, when, you know, when they get sick, when they get an infection or fall or whatever, they may not want anything done. And at the moment, there's a move to treat these people in their home. And that's a good thing. You know, you may get your antibiotics and even your drips in the home. But when you ask people, maybe if they, if they, if they know that they haven't got all that long to live, maybe they don't want any active treatment, but they certainly don't want to be in pain or they don't want to be suffering. So it's important with all of these advanced care directives that you don't say unless you really want to that you know that you want to have this treatment in the home maybe you don't want the treatment in the home especially in view of the prognosis yeah. and i also mentioned there, there are palliative care services at based in most hospitals who can visit people at home and if the palliative care doctors or uh, a gp decides that someone is in the last 48 hours of their life there is a service that can be obtained paid for by the commonwealth government to have a nurse in the home for the last 48 hours of life to support people. Now, that's not a judgment that a, a lay person can make, um, but you know, the, the palliative care doctors can support people at home before that 48 hours as well, but they just, they won't, they'll be visiting intermittently and they can provide medication to keep people comfortable and to stop them suffering during their final days. So, so is that something that, um a family member could, could ask like for instance if your um, elderly frail elderly uh, loved one family member has been admitted and you sort of think that maybe it's got to an end stage do, do does the the relative say is you know 
is my loved one to a stage where they are within the time where they could get um, palliative care at home? We know they'd like to, do, do, is it up to the person, to the family member to ask the medical team that and, and get the palliative care involved? We usually can offer palliative care in hospitals. So if, you know, we're usually offering it more than people are asking for it, but the family can ask for palliative care support both at home or in the emergency department or in hospital, mm -hmm. uh, you know, for, for their loved one, definitely. Thanks for that. So the second question that came in was that this person um, said that they were confused regarding the difference between an advanced care directive and shared decision making. I know Ken had explained that to me uh, when we met um, a while back. So maybe you'd like to go over how you see the difference between the 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 advanced. Yeah. Care. Look. Look. It's a. I mean, it's a relatively new concept, and it was. I, th I think it was first started in. Um, um, in Cambridge, in the UK, in Calgary, in Canada. And, and it's a way of exploring who the person is before you do the advanced care planning and the, you know, and the advanced care directive. So you spend a lot of time trying to find out who this person is, what are their attitudes, what are their beliefs, who are they, and, and whatever. So you do that first because that lends itself to well, they're this sort of person, therefore they would like this sort of health care. So, so it's sort of more, you know, it's more complex than advanced care directive. It's more complex than advanced care planning. Um, and it, it, it can be summarized as well. Like it needn't be 10 page document. You can summarize these things into, into increasingly more sort of concise ways. And there are two, um, there are two companies that I know of that actually have it, you know, they have a technologically based way of shared decision making where they explore attitudes, beliefs and, and that sort of person, you know, like, you know, like who the person is, is extremely important. And it's not something that we do well in health, who the person is, therefore the context of what they're planning and what their advanced care directives are. But look, look, it's sort of early days yet, but I, you know, but but the whole concept really, really appeals to me. And just, uh, an advanced care directive is a written document that people can fill out and sign that states clearly what their wishes for treatment are. And that has legal status. The courts have ruled in New South Wales that advanced care directive have legal status. So if a doctor goes against your advanced care directive, theoretically, they can be sued for assault. Um, so that the advanced care directives have standing in court, and you can put in your advanced care directive that you don't want particular treatments. Um, and so that really is helpful to show to doctors, if you do come to the emergency department, or if you are looking for help about what the limitations of your treatment that you desire are. So it's very important. And um, it's great to have a good discussion before you write the advanced care directive so that you're with your family so that they understand the basis for your decisions. And so when it comes to the point, the pointy end of the decision making, when if you get to hospital and you've got your advanced care directive, the family will support what the advanced care directive says. Because the worst thing is that someone comes in and says, no, they were demented already when they wrote that. That's not how they thought. They really want all treatment. They want to go to ICU. And then doctors go, well, we don't know what to follow. Yep. We don't know what to do. Penny, did you want to ask something? Um, I just wanted to, uh, Gideon and Ken probably don't know that our last session was a very detailed um, uh, session on advanced care planning with um, two very experienced practitioners um, so if any I've, I've put a link to the recording in the chat and also a link to dying with dignity's advanced care planning resources which has two sample advanced care directives plus the forms for appointing an enduring guardian so when we circulate the recording of this session we'll also put a link in to the previous one and to our materials on our website and I, I think that it's just critical that we have these documents in place. And one important thing that came out of the last session is the just 
imperative of discussing with your family what you want so that there's not confusion when everyone's standing around over the intensive care, care bed wondering what their loved one would have wanted. So the more you can talk with loved ones about these things, the better, even though they're difficult conversations. Yep. Hundred percent. I'm a big fan of advanced care directives, and I feel we need to keep talking about it and keep mentioning it so that to empower people to make their own decisions. Mm. It, uh, the, the question that came after that one was, uh, is the shared decision making an actual document? Can you mention that there's a company that does things, but is it is there a form for it or is it just a matter of writing it down? And no, it's, it, yeah, look, look, it's an, I, you know, like, like there are two ways of doing it. One, 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 you can have training and there are several centres in Australia, you know, like in Australia, one in Geelong, one in Melbourne where it's a three day course and people are trained in how to do this. But I mean, you know, but but I mean, as Gideon says that that leads to, you know, that actually leads to the legal document, the advanced care directive. So, you know, and so it's important that we emphasize the advanced care directive is the only legal document. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I think it helps if also we know who the person is and what and 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 what led to them making these decisions mm -hmm. um that you know and there's also a movement to say well you know like, like we not only don't want cpr we don't want hospitalization we don't want rcu but but there's a movement to say well you know like if i was demented then i then i'd like a b c or d or if i was in severe untreatable pain then i'd like a b c or d or if i was Bed bound or whatever, so that we make make the context clearer as well. And I was wondering if um, you're in that situation, for instance, an elderly person falls, they're not found for a long time, they've got had a heart attack, their kidneys are failing because they've been, you know, on the ground or whatever. They go to emergency. Um, there's a night, there's a team that looks like they survive the first night in emergency, and there's then there's a team, so doctor fixing, trying to fix the kidneys, a, a heart specialist, all of that, multiple uh, specialists fixing individual organs. But is there, if the person is is elderly, sort of say ninety years old, um, is there anyone that is looking at the big picture, and is there? any way like who in the hospital is there funding like I know in your book from 2009 you said one of the reasons why the the conveyor belt happens is is a lack of funding um for sort of alternative end of life care but are there people in hospitals uh in around New South Wales who a family member could call on to come and support the family and the medical team and sort of be like the 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 voice of reason about looking at the big picture rather than saying we can put a pacemaker in which will stop your heart doing this and we can you know circulate all this fluid which is going to hopefully mm. store the kidneys um is there is there a staff member that that can be brought in to that team who looks at what we're talking about night now yeah, look, look, I love, I like your word, big picture, but you know, like, like unfortunately, medicine is now compartmentalized. So if if we take your if we take your hypothetical patient, um, you know, the one that's had the fracture laying around, etc., well, we can fix the fracture, we can fix the pressure areas, we can fix the renal failure, we can fix the heart failure, and so what actually happens with that patient, and it you know, like it's bizarre, but there's a whole lot of single organ, very specialized doctors who are called in. So you get this committee medicine and the, uh, these are wonderful doctors if you've got these single problems. But when you're looking at the context of a 90 year old who didn't want to go to the hospital in the first place, there is no big picture person or maybe there is a big picture person, but they're very, very difficult to find. And, and so it's very difficult to pluck them off this conveyor belt. You know, you've got a whole lot of these wonderful doctors who can fix all of those little individual things that you mentioned, and we can keep these people alive. But 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 you're absolutely right. There is no, well, well there's very little in the way of big picture people. Now, if, if you're fortunate, 
you may get a palliative care physician or you may or you may get a very good you know sort of um yeah um you know sort of uh, um uh ger geriatric doctor you know who who can pluck you off this situation but sometimes that happens and sometimes it doesn't so yes getting yes, I, would, I would hope that the person would get admitted under geriatric medicine and i, I would hope that that's what always happens but i i, I know it's not always the case but it, it usually is and and we do raise this topic with families and 90 percent of the time people get what we're saying immediately and often they say that mum wouldn't have wanted this or dad wouldn't have wanted this although they haven't always formally written an advanced care directive mm. but five or ten percent of people we get into this prolonged going around in circles argument that you know we're trying to deny their parent life-saving treatment and they think that we're, we're, we're being mean to them whereas in fact we're, we're being kind to them and and i think everyone on this webinar understands that. So um, the next question, and I'm, I'm not vetting the question, so I just read them. Um, I will vet them if, if there's anything disrespectful, but this person says, if advanced care plan, plans um, are not used by doctors, how do we expect shared decision-making to have up an uptake? Any thoughts on that one? Look, we did a survey where um, we were asking doctors why they didn't raise the topic of advanced care directives with their patients. And they said almost universally, they are waiting for the patient to raise it. And when we asked the patient why they didn't raise the topic of advanced planning with their doctor, they said they were waiting for the doctor to raise it. So it's like a topic that no one raises, but everyone wants to talk about. Yeah. So you've just got to get out and talk about it and not wait for the other person. If you think about it, talk about it. You know, it's not a taboo topic. It happens to everyone. Death is part of life. It's the most natural thing. We are programmed to die. So not talking about it is absurd. And we have to get out and just talk about it because it's 100% natural. So the next question is, will doctors respect will doctors respect my wishes not to be treated if I ask for it? I would say 90% of doctors do, or probably higher, but there's always a percentage. I mean, in the same way, there's doctors have beliefs of their own, which sometimes restrict what things they're willing to do or willing not to do. Sometimes those are religious beliefs, sometimes philosophical. So I can't guarantee that every doctor in Australia will be persuaded by an advanced care directive because I know some of them have very strong beliefs about treatment. Mm -hmm. But they should refer you to another doctor or accept that you'll go to a different doctor if they don't agree with what you're doing. And you don't have to take the opinion of the first doctor you see. You can ask for someone else to treat you. You're allowed to do that. That's everybody's right. Yeah, so some of the data says that while while sort of, you know, like advanced care directives are very common, so, sometimes, it, it, yeah, yeah, um, you know, they've got a low priority is a way that I can put it. And I'm not, I'm not too sure what, what, you know, how this happens, but, you know, they get caught up in the treadmill. Oh, well, you know, like, like we only need to be doing this and we only need to be doing that. And so the relatives sometimes are reluctant to say yes, but they wouldn't have liked this. Um, so that that's why I get back to community being empowered to, you know, to speak up more often. Um, and you know, like there's lot, and you know, in fact, there was recent data from Victoria which said that only ten percent of advanced care directives were taken notice of. So that that's appalling. Um, and you know, some some hospitals are much better than other hospitals, but that but that requires a culture change within the hospital, but it also um, needs sort of community empowerment. I just would like to go back um, to uh, the questions from Liz, who uh, read your book recently. 
she said, you talk approvingly in the book about the Oregon end of life system. How would you characterize it and why can't it happen here? Oh, look, that, that was extraordinary. Like, like my wife's my wife's sister was dying. I mean, she wasn't old. She was dying from another disease. And so she asked if I could fly over and help. So I did. And I sat down with her and we constructed, um, you know, over three days, we constructed what she would want. So, you know, like, like, it, like it was called Denise's Manifesto. And then I'm, you know, and then I was thinking, this poor lady is going to encounter the American health system. And there's going to be a whole lot of people who just want to make a lot of money from her. And so we took we took the three page manifesto into the general practitioner and said, look, you know, we've got all the answers for this. It's called, you know, like it's called hospice care. So we said, no, we don't want hospice care. That's just exactly what we don't want. She wants to be at home. She doesn't want escalation of treatment, et cetera, et cetera. So she said, no, it's, it's a way of keeping people in the home. So you get a nurse comes every single day. There, um, there was a speech therapist. There was a social worker twice a week. There, there, was, um, uh, there, were, uh, there was a music therapist who came twice a week playing the harp of all things in the corner. So this was the Rolls Royce. And the next day, Becky arrived. Becky's the nurse. And so she 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 is assigned to that particular person. And so she comes every day. And so she's honest. She knows how to talk about dying. And, <clears throat> and so for the next three months, she had the most wonderful death. This is in America, the 36th worst health system in the world by any by any measurements. And here you've got the Rolls Royce of treatment. Now why did this occur? It, occur, it occurred under, um, under, under Obamacare and it happened because it saves money. So the person's treated in the home with a Rolls Royce of treatment um, and they don't go to the hospital. It costs $5,000 per patient per day to treat someone in my intensive care unit. Imagine what you could do with $5,000 every day the best hotel in Sydney, 24-hour nursing, you know, the best meals, whatever you want. And, and so that's why she had the Rolls-Royce treatment. It was, it was to save money, but very impressive, brilliant. Wow. I think we could all yeah. think that would be a good idea, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, so there's a few questions that I think have been answered. I will read them out, but I, I don't think we need to spend time on them because I want to get down to see if we're, uh, we're going into other areas. But um, what this person has asked, how do we get our wishes embedded and actioned in the healthcare system? I think you've both covered that uh, with the and Penny as well, with the importance of advanced care planning, uh, doing your documents, the advanced care directives, appointing your enduring guardian. And if so, anyone here doesn't know what those things are yet, I think I would suggest watching the previous uh, webinar rather than taking up a lot of time now on that. And also um, what Kim was saying about shared decision making. Um, the other one uh, that question says, can advanced care planning and shared decision making go hand in hand? I think you could probably nod yes for that. Yep, good. Um, what about having a preliminary discussion with our own GP? Can hospitals be encouraged to check with the GP at the point of crisis? Is that something that either of you would like to comment on? If, if, if someone... Well... Yeah, well, well, of course they should, but I mean, it often doesn't happen, does it? What do you think, Gideon? We we often do try to check with GPs, but I mean, the GPs are often only available during office hours, and if the patient comes into ED at six o'clock at night or midnight, you you've got no access to the GP records at all. So that's where having an advanced care directive that you bring with you is vital. That that's a transportable record of your conversation with your GP or other health care provider. Um, and, and also some GPs don't work every day and we often get into a, a, a it take, can take days sometimes to contact the GP and get the information. So you need something that's available at the pointy end of the discussion. Mm. 
And it's definitely, I can tell you from the last webinar, very important to have multiple copies of your advanced care directive and give it to your next of kin. So if you've got three children, give it to each of them because one of them might be on holiday at Byron Bay or worse still in Spain. Mm. And, you know, the younger one doesn't have it. So give it to, you know, even your next door neighbour or a close friend because if the person is admitted in a crisis situation, they're going to want to ask, they'll ask if the person is elderly, um, if there is an advanced care directive so if someone has it close at hand some people I know have it on their fridge um, I had a friend with multiple sclerosis it was on a fridge you know pinned on the fridge for ambulance to see uh, so definitely uh, you know have it in as many places although somebody said they didn't want it out on the hall table because it remind they wanted to do the advanced care directive and then put it away so they didn't have to think about the end of their life which I thought okay well that's fair enough you might mightn't be the thing you want to have staring you in the face as you go for the milk um, and might some people might say that they they you know, they, they won't call an ambulance, so it's not an issue. But the reality is you could collapse at your relative's place or in the street, in a shopping centre, and someone else calls an ambulance for you. So don't assume that just because you yourself wouldn't call an ambulance, that you never end up in one. Yeah. And just very, this is a quick one. Does the document uh, have to be witnessed by a solicitor um, or justice of the peace? It's the enduring guardian document that has to be witnessed uh, or done with a solicitor, but your advanced healthcare directive doesn't have to be uh, signed by a solicitor. It, but it, uh, Colleen, uh, Professor Colleen Cartwright did recommend that you, you do it with your GP, uh, especially so she suggests that they fill out a, a part of it that says that you, at the time that you did it, you had decision-making capacity. And that way, if there's any challenge by family members, you know, you can write your advanced care directive without that, but she highly recommends that you do have it um, uh, signed by your GP, but it, that one doesn't have to be by a solicitor. Um, how, and, how and when do we initiate a shared decision-making discussion? Yeah, look, we, we've actually, um, you know, we're, we're sort of thinking to start with people who were near the end of life, like within 12 months, say. Um, but look, if, if, you, if I mean, if you think about this one, logically, it should be done as early as possible. It should be done, you know, when you're young, for example. Um, but, but, you know, but, but we're starting with sort of identification of people who we think are in the last 12 months of life. So we start there. But it just makes sense that the earlier you, you know, you do these things, the better. Yeah, there's no time like the present. Now is the time. If you're writing a will, if you're starting a funeral plan, if you're doing anything like that, if you can talk about, you know, what happens to your stuff after you die, then you can talk about dying. If you're talking about where you want to be buried, you can talk about dying. It's, uh, you know, don't what no one knows. Mo most people don't know when they're in the last 12 months. Um, so just start as early as possible. Penny? Um, question for uh, both Ken and Gideon. Um, my personal experience and having heard numerous people voice the same concerns is that they want to talk like Gideon said before it's like a Mexican standoff the patient's waiting for the doctor to raise it and the doctor's waiting for the patient to raise it but there have been numerous instances where the patient has tried to raise it with the doctors and they won't talk about it for some um, misguided idea that it's going to cause the patient to lose hope. Now, maybe that's a smokescreen for the doctor being uncomfortable talking about it and hoping to flick pass it on to someone else. Um, it can be very confronting for people who, um, you know, we have this sort of idea of doctors as godlike creatures and people can feel quite intimidated pressing their uh, medical and healthcare providers. How, how can we be empowered to be more assertive in asking these questions and insisting on things? It's sort of like the doctor knows best um, type of healthcare and often that leads to people feeling sort of pushed, whether overtly or um, 
covertly, but feeling like they had no choice in the matter when it really is their decision to make. How, how can we sort of be more proactive and um, forceful? I know that's difficult for a lot of people. Some people find it easy to insist on things, but have you got any sort of strategies or tools about how to try and kick that door open a little bit? We, we tried to lobby the government to make a Medicare item number for GPs to do advanced care planning. And mm. unfortunately, we're unsuccessful. But perhaps a consumer organisation like Dying With Dignity may have more luck in convincing the government to do something like that. Mm. And if there was an item number, it would be, I think, easier for a lot of GPs to have that discussion because it's they know it's not a short discussion. It can't fit into a six-minute consultation. And... So, you know, it, it's, it's complicated for them. You don't need a GP to write an advanced care directive, but I think it is important to talk to a healthcare practitioner. And uh, it's, it's, it is difficult because some people don't want to talk about it. Some GPs have difficulty talking about it. Yeah. It's, you know, like it's, you know, like it's best not to be, you know, not to be in the hospital. It's best, you know, sort of while well, we're talking about this issue, it's best not to come to the hospital because then it's almost too late. And, and so we're talking about the word uncertainty here. And if there's uncertainty about whether one can survive or not, then the doctor will almost always say, let's keep going. Where it, and, and that's very difficult, isn't it, for the relatives to say, well, let's not keep going. Because, because there's uncertainty. Uncertainty is a key word here. Uh, and it's a, word, it's a word that the health system uses to keep going, keep going. And that's very difficult. But I think, uh, you know, like, like I'll come back to sort of empowering, empowering the community is the answer. And that, that's what, you know, that's what you've done with, with your organisation. It, it wasn't the doctors, it was, it, it was you people. It was you people who empowered yourselves to to make these, you know, crucial and very important changes that you've achieved. So I think it seems like a, the the Medicare item number thing is something that we will be dealing with, um, at, like lobbying for uh, for voluntary assisted dying, which obviously we're not talking specifically about tonight, but it is. Uh, obviously what was our key purpose and uh, our, the law will come into effect on the 28th of November. But one of yeah, the problems that we see uh, and that, that's already happening in other states is that there's not a, that's another process that takes long consultations and doctors are not reimbursed for that. So I think if we're doing it for the voluntary assisted dying assessment process, then we should definitely be also lobbying for one for advanced care planning, because it certainly would probably be a half an hour consultation I would imagine. Yeah. Um, so uh, someone um, pointed out that um, advanced care directives can only give indication, uh, but that doctors always listen to the family. So once again, that's reinforcing the idea that, yes, write down your wishes, but make sure that your family understand them so that they support, you know, you've got the document and you've got the family member if you're not able to speak for yourself. And if you're able to speak for yourself, speak up if you're in bed just because you've got your children around it's you that's in there if you if you're not um unconscious i think try and speak up um and someone has also suggested uh that you know we all need to talk we've all agreed on that and they said that palliative care australia has some great free conversation starters so anyone that wants to um, get some ideas about how to start these conversations with family members maybe have a look at palliative care australia um, uh, I have an, this is another question, I have an advanced, not mine, from one of the audience, I have an advanced care directive, which my GP holds in the event of me being admitted to hospital following a medical incident, how would the hospital be aware of my wishes? Uh, well, I think I probably covered that. You, we are a little bit concerned if your advanced care directive is only held with the GP because um, they they may only be open through the day. So I think it's good that the GP has it, but um, depending on your situation, if you're if you are likely to be going to hospital on a, a number of occasions um, for various health reasons, maybe have it really close at hand at home, but also have your family members having a copy. Would you um, both agree with that? 
Yep. Um, will dying with dignity legalization be changed since Labor government came to power? Uh, not well, no, it won't. It's going ahead. Nothing can stop the introduction of the voluntary assisted dying laws. And fortunately, a lot of uh, the um, key members of the uh, new state government uh, did support the bill. Obviously, both parties did get a conscience vote, and uh, the current premier, Chris Minns, actually uh, didn't vote, didn't support the bill, but it, it passed with a significant majority. And uh, I, I don't think we have to be too concerned, particularly with the change of government. Um, how do we initiate shared decision making when the doctor is patronising and doesn't encourage discussion? Yeah, I think I'm, I mean I think it comes back you know like it comes back to Gideon's point. It's almost too late once you're in a hospital to have shared decision making, um, be, because the person's sick and you know they're on this treadmill. So I mean it's important to do these things earlier before you're hospitalised. Um, this next question says, for my parents who died in 2013 and 2017, I found that doctors in public hospital didn't want to read the advanced care directive until they did read them and see that my parents had very specific instructions. My mother was geriatric trained, was a geriatric trained nurse, so knew what was needed. Uh, so, so that's actually more just a statement, I think, rather than um, yet yeah, a question there. Uh, someone else commented that dying is not. I just word. say in response yep. to that that if the doctors don't want to read or pay attention to the advanced care directive, you can mention that they can be sued for assault if they don't follow it, mm -hmm. and that may sharpen their attention span. Sure, that's good advice. Mm -hmm. uh, this person says I have an advanced care directive which states that with certain conditions, such as being locked in after a stroke. I am not to receive any treatment, food or hydration. Will that be respected? Oh, so, so, certainly, certainly with that with that particular condition, absolutely. But but it gets it get, you know, but then one has to extrapolate and think about, well, what if you've got dementia or you're bed bound or you've got sort of untreatable pain or whatever? Um, you know, like like it's important to also include your wishes there about under those circumstances, you you want no treatment or you want a little bit of treatment in the home or you want the the full Monty, so to speak. I agree with Ken. It's better not to specify a precise condition for which you don't want treatment for, because you know hot, there are so many there are thousands of conditions that you can get. So. Your, if you only specify what treatment you want for one condition, 99.99% of the time, your advanced care directive won't be applicable. Mm. So you want something that's broader to cover your, your general state, not your diagnosis. Um, so the, uh, this question is, should there be an encouragement for people to put their wishes into their wills? Should the person with power of attorney be given express authority to respect the wishes of the person they are in charge of? Uh, I, I, yeah, Penny, you may as well, yeah, a quick answer for that one. Yeah, um, everyone should bear in mind that the will is only relevant after you have died. And a power of attorney is a document that, gives um, another person the right to deal with your financial and legal affairs. So in the context of things that um, deal with your medical care, there's the advanced care directive, which is a legally binding document which sets out the treatments that you do and don't want. Uh, and an enduring guardianship is another um, legal document which gives decision-making power to a, a person of your choice and that only kicks in if you are not able to make the decisions yourself. So the will and a financial power of attorney are two entirely separate things. What we need to focus on is the advanced care directive and the enduring guardianship. So we'll, like I said earlier, we'll put the, the links to our previous webinar and those advanced care directive and enduring guardianship forms in the email when we circulate this recording. But um, going to Gideon's point about being specific 
about what you do and don't want, um, we provide two sample advanced care directives. One is very long and detailed, which is more of a um, useful for a discussion to get a feeling for the types of things that might happen and you can then get a feel for the types of treatments that you may or may not want. But the New South Wales Health template for an advanced care directive is more values based and it um, enables you to set out um, what would be unbearable for you in certain circumstances. So for some people um, not being able to communicate, in other instances not being able to attend to your personal care, those sort of things give the guidance to the, the treating doctors about the types of things, uh, treating doctors and your family, that gives them the flavour of what would be an unbearable life for you and then it sets out certain things like um, CPR or um, um, artificial feeding and nutrition and that sort of thing. So it's worth having a look at our guide to get um, some really practical ideas about what sorts of things you can and can't specify. The other important thing with the advanced care directives is that you can only specify what treatment you don't want you can't say that you do want you know treatment a or treatment b in certain circumstances so you can't for example ask for voluntary assisted dying in an advanced care directive can i just say you can ask for treatment but you you can't doctors aren't compelled to do treatment that you ask for so um it, it doesn't help you to specify that you want a treatment um, but it, it really helps to specify what treatment you don't want to have. So, so I copied the first questions. We've got 10 minutes to go. So there's a few people that have uh, written, rather than a question, they've just written about their own experience. So I do appreciate those contributions, but I think I might scroll down to just see if there's um, uh, any further questions. So this person has asked, can failure to call an ambulance or to decline treatment proposed by a doctor amount to elder abuse from the family member making those decisions? It's complicated. In certain circumstances, it can. If the elderly person's wish is to have an ambulance called or is to have treatment for that condition, and their carer, whether it be a relative or not, makes decisions which are against the elderly person's expressed wishes that could potentially amount to elder abuse. Mm. So that's where it's important that everybody knows what the older person's wishes are and respects those wishes. Yep. Um, going against the wishes either way is, is not a good thing. And Heath Reid uh, answered that question in the chat in case people missed it. That sounds like a very nuanced situation that will need more information and expert advice. And he suggested that you call Senior Rights Service to talk about that further. So there are, uh, you know, other... Uh, services that people can, you know, ask questions, uh, get legal advice, etc. And uh, there's links there. No, that's the, the government one. I don't know, Penny and Heath, whether you've been scrolling through the questions, if you speak up, if you feel that there's questions that, I, that I've missed or because it looks like there's still quite a few there. Uh, look, there's some fantastic questions and information coming through on the chat. So thank you all so much for your contribution. It is extremely valuable to us, particularly as our organisations reshaping after the campaign. So even if we're not able to get to them during this webinar, they are really valuable and we will hold on to those and look at um, our resources and the information that we provide in the future. There has been a few questions, though, particularly in an emergency situation. I think it might be useful just to clarify um, some of those. And that's around ambulance officers ignoring advanced care directives and the instructions that they've actually been provided with uh, New South Wales Ambulance. I do know from my work that they are trialling different things at the moment, but that's not been rolled out across New South Wales. So we can't, I can't give you a response. Um, but perhaps... Uh, 
Ken or Gideon, you could comment on that. The situation of ambulances has changed a lot. They used to have a form that we could fill in to direct what treatment someone should have and was stored on their database, but they've withdrawn that. And I'm not entirely certain why they withdrew that. And I, I think, as you said, they're discussing the issue and coming to a new policy, but I don't know what that policy is going to be um, or what their thoughts are on that policy at the moment. My, my understanding from some of the trials, and please, this is just um, early, early, early information, so this is not confirmed, but it's really working with patients who they know are palliative um, and seeing how they can operate within that immediate palliative care space um, so that they're aware of patients in their area, in their, um, you know, their local catchment, uh, so they're not uh, just receiving calls um, and going out without any information, but actually having some of that information prior to the call and a little bit more history and a specific different form um, that could be provided and prepared and sitting with the patient, uh, much like they do with residential aged care facilities. Um, Ken, did you? Yeah, yeah Shane, can, can, can I just make um, a, a point, I guess, before we finish, and that is that dying... Dying is currently medicalized. It, it, it's, you know, it's a medicalized process and it should be a social process. And if, if, one, if, one, if, if one looks at what are the priorities, particularly of the elderly frail who are in the last few months of life, they are not medical. These people don't want to live longer. They don't want to go into hospital. They don't want to go into EDs. So, so I think so. I think if we stand back and look at the broader perspective here, that we need to get away from the medicalization of dying. And if one looks at the overwhelming evidence, when you ask these people what are their priorities, it's not medical. It's you know like it's sort of loneliness. It it's it's someone to do the shopping. It's someone to clean the house. It's you know the, these are the top ten priorities. And there are, you know, there are certain there are certain organisations in Australia that are now are now working with the, you know, the non medical care of of you know of people, you know, who are in the last few months of life, so that it's aligned with their wishes. Um, and I think that's important if we look at the overall perspective of dying and how it's become medicalised. So someone a little bit further up in the chat um, uh, questioned whether sort of refusing futile treatment, how that fits with the Hippocratic Oath. And I noticed that we have another doctor um, in the audience who has answered saying the Hippocratic Oath is not fit for purpose in this day and age. No medical students swear it. I didn't, and I graduated in Melbourne over 40 years ago. So that's good to hear from um, another doctor. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. You don't have to worry about the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, it was certainly you. brought up a lot during the uh, assisted dying campaign. Uh, Nikki asked, is voluntary assisted dying um, on track for implementation? Yes, it is. Uh, do you think this will improve shared decision making about end of life? I certainly think it will. Um, you know, it, 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 when people know that they can, uh, that the law exists, um, even if they aren't going to fit the quite narrow eligibility criteria, I, I hope that it will um, allow uh, the, you know, anybody that's approaching the end of life to at least raise it with their doctor. So maybe there'll be a, 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 um, an advantage to people, even if they're not going to actually qualify, because they will be able to raise the subject with their doctors. Do, do either of you, uh, um, Ken or Gideon, have an opinion on that? I know that you're not experts on, on the new law and obviously it hasn't, hasn't taken effect yet, but do you feel that now that New South Wales is the, the last state to pass uh, voluntary assisted dying legislation, that it will improve other end-of-life uh, conversations? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You know, you, 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 know, uh, you know, like you, you people have actually changed the culture of our society and i'm sure and i'm sure that that will lead to an opening of discussions along the lines that we're having now well done 
Thank you. If if I can just add to that, I've actually seen that occurring already through my work in primary health networks and each local health district, because um, in New South Wales, our, our public health system um, is broken down into health districts. Uh, each one of those will have an implementation team with an implementation committee um, who are all directors and department heads. And it's inviting a conversation that never, ever happened before mm -hmm. and bringing different departments together that were never brought together necessarily before and having these specific conversations. So even before... Um, we actually begin on the 28th of November, uh, this has begun those conversations that never ever had a platform before. So I think only good can come from that. Mm. I think you don't. Well, I'm just scrolling down to see. If oh, can I just make one further comment on that? Um, a, a vehement opponent of BAD um, in the palliative care space did confess to me that um, our uh, lobbying had actually been advantageous to them because a lot of people had a great misapprehension about end of life generally, but also what palliative care does and can do. So uh, I then countered with saying that perhaps we're the best thing that ever happened to you. Um, and as part of the process of getting VAD laws passed in each state, uh, one of the positive outcomes for them is that there's been a significantly increased investment in palliative care, which is wonderful for everyone. So um, even, even if you don't agree with VAD, I think it has improved the conversation and made people who didn't want to talk about this a bit more comfortable in doing so. Just um, one final question. What role can registered nurses play in improving the situation? Well, hopefully, you know, like a much a much greater role than what they currently have. They're, you know, they're grossly underutilised part of the health service. The nurses are vital for these to help with the shared decision-making discussions because nurses do have more time be able to have detailed discussions than GPs often do or specialists often do. And, and they understand, you know, the context of the disease and the prognosis and uh, they have that medical background, that the clinical background that helps them to, to be able to talk in a knowledgeable way about this. So it can be very helpful if people do have a, a registered nurse that they're in contact with to, to have some discussion with that registered nurse. Though again, some of them might have beliefs against advanced care planning or voluntary assisted dying, but you know, most of them will be prepared to have the discussion or refer on to someone who, who is knowledgeable and able to have the discussion. Mm -hmm. and, and just finally, because I think we should, uh, I think uh, Gideon and Ken have been very generous with their time, so I don't want to go uh, much further, but the, the questions that are related to um, private hospitals and will they uh, be obliged to comply. We will continue to have uh, these uh, webinars um, and as we get closer to the implementation of voluntary assisted dying law in New South Wales, we will definitely, there'll be opportunities for all of you to ask more questions and we can certainly, we will obviously be focusing on voluntary assisted dying, but there will be the opportunity to ask other questions about end of life situations. And at this stage, the next topic uh, that uh, or the, the guest speakers that I'd like to line up for our next webinar, which you will all be emailed about, of course, is um, uh, end of life doulas. Um, this is something not everyone may be aware that there are just like there are um, birth doulas or midwives and things. There, there is a growing number of people who are becoming end of life doulas. So that's a topic we'll be looking at um, probably in the next webinar. So I think we'll wind up there. And uh, on behalf of everyone here, I'd like to thank um, Professor Ken Hillman and Associate Professor Gideon Kaplan. Thank you so much for your time and for this interesting discussion. There were some um, uh, messages of gratitude in the chat and I'm sure the over 500 people that have taken part tonight um, will be very grateful. Um, so thank you.
And um, if I haven't forgotten anything else, as I said, everybody who registered for this webinar will be sent a link to the recording. But even if um, uh, people don't receive the link, it will we'll also put something up on the website. It just might take a week or so. And uh, I hope you'll all keep an eye out for the next one. So good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night.